Good evening. I'm Kimberly Nightingale, and I'm the Executive Director of the St. Paul Almanac. It's beautiful to see all of you here tonight. I'd like us to give a big round of applause to the Black Dog for hosting us tonight. Um, we'd also like to tell you that you can buy St. Paul Almanacs right here at the Black Dog Cafe. They're um, right near the cash register, uh, so feel free to do that. Um, the St. Paul Almanac is a literary organization that creates opportunities for understanding, learning, and building relationships through sharing people's stories, and we'd like to thank our sponsors. This activity is made possible in part by funds provided by the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council from an appropriation by the Minnesota Legislature, the Lower Town Future Fund of the St. Paul Foundation, McKnight, St. Paul, Mardig, and Bigelow Foundations, Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, KFAI Radio, and St. Paul Neighborhood Network. St. Paul Neighborhood Network airs our shows throughout the month on their cable access channel. We'd also love to thank Takumba Aiken, our incredible artist. <laughs> Takuma will be drawing the action as it is happening. Uh, Jay Otis Powell tonight is our curator and tonight's show is titled Three Artists and Three Themes. Jay Otis Powell says, I am, alternately, I am alternatively using punctuations in my name that express my personal journey toward wholeness while using them less in my poetry. I work as a writer, performance artist, mentor, curator, consultant, and philosopher, open space technology facilitator, public speaker, and arts administrator. I keep finding new ways to describe who I am because I am a being in motion. I won't settle for identity as a limitation or a box to die in. I sing horn lines to avant-garde music to remind myself that I came from somewhere original and bold, and I'm going somewhere else. I am a founding curator for Bridges, a performance arts program with Pangea World Theater. I have been a recipient of a Loft Creative Nonfiction Award, a Jerome Travel and Study Grant, a Jerome Mid-Career Artist Grant, and an Intermedia Arts Interdisciplinary McKnight Fellowship. I was a founding producer of Write on Radio, the Twin Cities Literary Connection at KFAI while working as Communities Liaison and Program Director for Interdisciplinary Collaboration at the Loft Literary Center. The Minnesota Spoken Word Association awarded me their Urban Grio Innovator Award and inducted me into the Minnesota Spoken Word Association's Hall of Fame. Please welcome yeah. Jay Otis Powell. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. I have a lot of business to attend to, so I will try to handle my business and do the art with as much grace as I can. The first thing I'd like to do is to um, talk about the evening I've put together. Uh, the three artists, three themes was what I decided to do uh, when mm -hmm. um, I realized who I was going to invite to do it with me. Because I know Shea Cage uh, and I know Tish Jones from years of associating in the writing spoken word community. I didn't want them to feel limited by a theme that I chose for them. And so I gave them the option to choose their own themes. Although I did make a suggestion to Shea. <laughs> that she do something from a work in progress that I've seen, and I think she wanted to do something from that anyway, so I, I don't think it was an imposition. The theme that Shay will be um, reading work from, or performing work from this evening is N period, I period, G period, G, how many G's in that word? N period, I period, G period, E period, R period, is that it? I left out a G. I thought there was another G, but you know, when I do it any other time, I, f I remember the other, the other G. And um, I think she wrote it that way to keep from it just being a word that we say because you know the word became taboo to say. The NAACP years ago actually buried the word and said we couldn't say it anymore. 
And so we're going to be addressing that theme of that word in this evening, which is actually consistent with the theme that I've chosen for my work, which is reclamation. And we are reclaiming that word along with some other words and some other things this evening. I'm going to be preclaiming, reclaiming, and then actually claiming for the first time some things that have shown up in my poetry. And uh, maybe along the way, I will be able to claim some new identity. And Tish Jones, uh, when I gave her the opportunity, said, well, let me get back with you on that. <laughs> and she eventually decided that her theme was going to be uh, confusion and chaos. And we've had a few conversations about that. And I'm the kind of guy who argues with everything anybody says to me. Just ask any of my friends. They will tell you that I'm an argumentative person and will accept any, any position not represented in the conversation already. So we had a few conversations about that. And uh, so those are the three themes, reclamation, nigger, and confusion and chaos. Let's see how we go in and out of those. Um, I have been writing a lot of new material. And um, most of the things that I will read tonight are probably things you haven't heard before or seen anywhere because I haven't performed them in public. I'm going to start with a piece that's um, apropos for what I've been affectionately calling my identity crisis. I'm reclaiming my new self as um, a human being growing out of my old self. Everything that I do is grown out of something. In November last year, I curated a show here that was called Duende and the Sound of Soul. Since then, everything has grown out of that. And so I'm at a point now where I feel like I need to introduce myself again, not only to you, but to me as well. So the title of this piece is By Way of Introduction. And how do we continue a conversation between ourselves and the world, between fact and friction, truth against mendacity, imagination confronting knowledge? I wish I could say I'm all ears, but I'd be lying. I'm mostly mouth. I hear what I know. News takes longer to land, settle. Let's talk about this without anxiety, pressure, or cliche. My erratic soul bends toward infinity with boundless ambition, twixt layers of inherited attitudes, ancient expectations. I meditate on impossibility, on escape, on dreaming of flight. My omphalus is free, though the creature between my wings is too pulled by gravity to fly. My joints make noise when I stand, turn, or reach for glory. Everything points to earth, soil. I don't know what to do with this identity crisis except explore it by way of introduction, by way of flirtatious exchanges between me and whoever I was, me and whoever you are. I'm a caterpillar again, moving through chrysalis, symbolizing emergence, some indigenous Americans recognize chrysalis as soul trapped in body. Release of a butterfly as freedom of soul upon death. Soul of ancestors liberated, flitting from flower to flower, restlessly 
of mind changing subjects focus. The Greek word for butterfly is psyche. I've never known what's best for me, but I know what I like. Inspired by the Baroness Nika, who loved Thelonious Monk the moment she heard Thelonious play. Baroness Pananaka de Conanwater Rothschild walked out or flew out of her own life, including a husband and five children, and devoted herself to bebop. The next exit waits for bold escapes by those in search of something new to believe. Some place with more room for creatures longing to fly. <clears throat> I've been in this community a long time, and um, there are people I see almost everywhere I go that's an important place to be, and one of those people is Takumba Iken. And I hadn't informed him about my identity crisis, or maybe I had, but when I saw him tonight, he hugged me and gave me a new name. And I'm going to try it out on y'all. I thought it was more appropriate when I was reading the poem I just read because, well, actually it makes sense. When he first said it, it just kind of sounded like a joke, but he called me Godfather of Souls. I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> but by way of introduction, I'm going to try it on, see how it fits. <laughs> so if you bold as Takumba, next time you see me, call me that. <laughs> <laughs> There's one more piece I want to share before I introduce the next reader. Um, I heard a song on um, Rockin' and Rhythm one day. And um, it inspired me to write something. And I spent weeks trying to write it. My, my process is agonizing. I don't recognize it. To, I, don't, I don't recommend it to anybody. I mean, I get an idea, and I get committed to trying to write about that idea every time I sit down. And I, I do research on it. and I. Um, I drive myself a little bit crazy, but I ruminated on this long enough to a story started to form. And it's actually a story I've been telling for years. I just never thought of writing the story. But once I started writing the story, of course, it went askance. It went awry. And uh, this is what it is right now. The working title is When a Cat Goes Out. He'd patrol the doorway, waiting to make his break. Or he'd scratch around the threshold, as if he could dig himself out. All they knew was out was where he wanted to be. When the opportunity was right, he bolt. When he went out that last time, looking for whatever he craved, then attempted to return, there was no there, there anymore. No familiar arms to welcome him back, no nimble fingers to massage his weary head, no food in his dish, no breast to fondle, no open door, no one knows where a wanderer goes when a prowler goes out. He sees what others can't because of askance perspectives. He makes patterns of disappearing after having been on the scene too long, and they speculate about where he's gone. He's got a woman across town, Ray said, who won't come out with him or hang with the likes of us. He has alternative personalities. 
Sometimes he's shy and reclusive, Dana chimed in. So he hides to sulk and write. He's often manic and won't come out in his depressive state. But that last time he went out, out swallowed him whole. So he stayed there in the belly of the beast too long to remember his way home. And when he arrived in a place he thought was home, everything recognizable was gone. Out has black holes that eat light, especially the kind in cat's eyes, the wide-eyed, bright enthusiasm that expects stuff is depowered, blacked out, like New York in a major storm. Scent of a woman and radar of voices bouncing off each other work like bat intelligence when the scent or the sense of sight is rendered invalid. So he closed his eyes and blew his saxophone, listening for echoes, feeling around for osmosis, believing in aural perceptions. What he heard confirmed he was still alive, though he had lost his way. He was out in front of something that didn't know anything about him, nor did he know anything about it. Home was not an avenue or a building where he used to live, but somebody who knew him and put up with his shenanigans. In was not the songs he already knew, but the ones he'd never heard that insisted on entering through soles of his feet before exiting the bell of his horn. When a cat goes out, there are no guarantees the locks will accept his old keys. So he crawls into a window when the front door is on fire. He rewrites his story to accommodate strangers to introduce himself again in a world that thought, in a world he thought he knew, in woodwork that's lost his scent. I have some housekeeping to do. The first thing is, St. Paul Almanac is a nonprofit that always pays artists. So please be generous in your donations. Also, one of the organizations, another organization that I work with in the Twin Cities is uh, the Archie Givens Foundation. And yeah. I've been involved in um, a retreat program that they have for African American writers. And they are accepting uh, applications again for a black writers retreat. Um, the deadline for application is January 4th, 2013. And the flyer, which was on your table, says, um, if you want to focus more on your writing, hone your craft with mentors and peers, et cetera, et cetera, then you should make that deadline if you're an African-American writer. If you're not an African-American writer, then you should tell an African-American writer that you know that they should apply. There are actually some fellows in the room that have gone through that program, so we can testify to the significance of it. I appreciate mentoring because it gives me an opportunity to share what I think I know 
with people who think they want to do what I've been doing. And um, it's important to me to be able to share my experience. I mean, that's why I write. It's because I think I have something to say. And when somebody um, develops a relationship with me that is um, a mentoring relationship, I am very respectful of the relationship because I've had mentors um, throughout my journey, and I think it's important to give it back. And I always learn as much from people that I mentor as uh, I may be teaching them because it's always a two-way street. And I don't mentor dumb people. So <laughs> thank you for being relaxed enough to laugh. I have been approached by dumb people. <laughs> they didn't want me as a mentor. <laughs> uh, so this is by way of introducing our next reader or performer. I'm not sure how that's going to turn out. I'm holding myself back tonight because um, a part of my identity crisis is I'm trying not to be so extravagant anymore. I just, I just want my words to perform as opposed to me being all gregarious and yelling and flailing and all that stuff I used to do. I, I've been through a lot of flailing. Reminds me of Dizzy Gillespie after the bebop era when he was a senior citizen. He says, yeah, a lot of wasted notes have been played. <laughs> I just want the words to play themselves these days. And so uh, I don't know what Tish is going to do, but she's young, and if she wants to flail, that's her prerogative. But uh, I'm trying not to do that. I don't, I don't know if I will be able to maintain my composure, but we'll see how that goes. Um, chaos and confusion, or confusion and chaos, which is it? Or does it matter? Confusion and chaos. Uh, we had a conversation where I was trying to get her to see that whether it was confusion or chaos was all a matter of perspective. And I think she was able to own that in a way that helped her get a little further on her journey. And I think that tonight we're going to get an installment of how that relates to her theme. Please welcome to the stage Tish Jones. <laughs> that I just want to do as like a dedication. So uh, earlier this month, a, a student of mine, a former student of mine was killed in North Minneapolis. Um, and I actually wrote this poem earlier this year when a different student was shot um, and in the hospital also in North Minneapolis. Um, so I just want to kind of just honor both of their spirits. Um, it's called Ghetto Garden, so I'm opening up. My little brother is 10. Sandy brown, sun-kissed skin, 73 pounds sopping wet, soaking in his surroundings. His tongue recites hip hop in beatbox and holy poetry. His neck, a bass lines vessel in the basement when he makes the kick boom with breath. Junior is a hooper like our dad. A hip hop head like his sister could be anywhere black. And I wonder, dear mother, did you ever dream your son a tree uncut, a date in suit, prom picture on mantle, man in cap and gown, or married? Murdered men make nightmares of a mother's dream for her boy. Dear mother Martin, mother Grant, mother Bell, mother's many. Black men in blossom, severed at the stem, never become blooming sons in sunblock prison cells or burrows they are found buried in by bullets seeking certain hues. You see, a system that should assist them clips them. And my brother is a concrete rose. Ancestral prose grows in each coiled hair atop his head, and I dream this nightmare dead daily. In North Minneapolis, 
I know a boy five shots more familiar with nothing. Sterile sheets remind him of everything he cannot recollect. The artistry stitched across his chest tells him of everything he was almost less like his flesh or the organs that make life's music, his breath. I think of my brother when I look at him, a young lover, hard enough to stand, soft enough to fall, a beauty born black, a dream fulfilled in the real of my consciousness, and I pray he have a chance to bloom. Word, thank you for letting me read that. How y'all doing? Word. Hey, sister, just hit stop after every situation. Side note, that was a sidebar. <laughs> Happens. We're comfortable. Whatever. All right, so check it out. Um, this piece um, is short, and the working title is Yesterday Was. I stood on a concrete beam called the curb in sneakers. Today in my eyes and yesterday in my heart. Today was beautiful. A new shade of progressive brown smiles, melodic stares and stories and art. But yesterday had heart, had been there. Bore the scars of my company. Seen me through to today. Yesterday taught me how to love. Today would teach me something new, but I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know none of that on that curb, on that curb. I knew today was enticing and inviting, and yesterday had been done. Even if it lingered on the inside, yesterday had been done. Today was coming quick and strong, with more than I can imagine, and I couldn't let today pass me by, and goodbye to yesterday was bittersweet, because we part never once we meet, and leaving, <laughs> leaving that makes me wish time stopped. All right, so on confusion and chaos, right? Maybe there is a, an ellipsis, and then I think of Jay Otis, and I think of like reclaiming that, because nah, it doesn't seem so confusing anymore. Um, yeah, this is called Hip Hop's Rebuttal. I was born beneath the ashes of my barren home in a bleak repeat of a time quite like befores when shores were breached and high tides of genocide took shape in different forms. I am a culmination of many scores spent in servitude and silence inside this great nation a product of natural selection. I have been surviving in the heart of the hungry, the humble, and the pure. I first became pleasant. A sweet perfume masking the stench of poverty and smile and aroma she could not pierce no matter what she pushed. I became powerful at the party. I even reclaimed the park. She took the presidency, I took the people, and we parlayed our way through syringes with needles piercing vinyl instead of our skin. That was my first win, when records spun. I remembered fun, channeled where I come from, polyrhythmic drum. You see, I have made revolutions around this world like the sun, and my roots have yet to become undone, only transformed the way I move. I began to count the groove too short, extended it to break free of capitalism's tight grip, found freedom in the kick, rock steady with quick steps and pulled everybody in, then came my voice, first in free verse, scriptless genius over the beat, toasting and boasting about where I've been, I then moved to the cipher to move the dancer, started to decipher all these institutions as a poor people's cancer, when I became a writer I started bombing banners, manners aside I was demanding answers, went from street corner banter to being slandered, made my debut on television as the voice of colored children gave them choice, something they had never tasted, a breath never taken. I allowed them an outlet and they gave me life. Igniting a burning Bronx atop cardboard, beatboxing their way through being a burdened demographic, captured time in rhyme, narrated their life having been robbed of their stories forever. We came up together in coochie sweaters. <laughs> or even better, Boom boxes nuzzled in between our necks and collarbones. Hammer bone chains changed into bling somewhere along the way. But pre that, I wore a door knocker, sported a gumby, and was comfy in my skin. My kin, akin by journey. Thinking back to way back then, I was public enemy number one, a thriving opposition to the powers that be. Still, do you remember me? I made you hip. 
I helped you out when your daddy dipped. When your mom had that coke habit she could hardly kick. When two short split returned and jigger mimicked it. I helped you swallow government cheese and death spreading through the heart of your city like a deadly disease. Crooked police, life on the streets, in the pen with neglect. And yet some say I am no longer legit. Got rich and only get into exploitation of my own as if I make the product the government ships or shapes into 78 minute mixtapes. They manipulate the sound and I get big. I went international, started making hits. And capitalism capitalizes off of all of it. How do they get me back? They pin me against myself, divide the culture, provide for vultures, package me, sell me only my derogatory imagery, limit me but give me airplay, only take the activists away so they say I don't exist, that I've switched, that I stand behind middle fingers instead of raised fists, containing no pulse. They say I'm dead, but little do they know I was there when Sean Bell was shot, Obama was elected, Bush Bowl guarded the ballots, our bayou was abandoned, the bricks of Cabrini Green barrel to the ground, that bullet took your boy. These kids began to smile. Obama was elected again through the burden of being black. And I rocked them to sleep just like I did you, those kids. They're just dressed in newer tennis shoes, teaching their skin to swallow their scars invisible. So when you marvel at how invincible they are, no, I am right here playing my part. Come see me. I'm free in the inner master of circumstances. I am not commercial, they threw me underground. There are no commercial breaks. There is an expressway being built through our borough, through our city, through St. Paul, next north side. Come on, y'all, whites buying up brown property. This is them framing me different, and you being so far into submission and missing inside of your day-to-day -day traditions that your vision is locked into more acquisition instead of what you have always had since the beginning. It's heart, it's core. They can never bring about my ending, but you, the capable, seem so willing, forgetting that right is relative. Trying to own me for your own instead of passing me off to your offspring. You supply them with the means. I mean, I do suffer, but I live in true heads. In programming for people of color by people of color. I live in the music made for movement, fostering growth since 1973 when I was given my name. I live. I remain. You don't. Hip hop. I'm a fan of hip hop, so here's a more contemporary spin on the validity of hip hop. This piece is untitled. Can I, what's the, so I know SPN and is like recording this thing. What's the language situation? National, like clean, that should be clean. Oh, just check it. All right. You <laughs> know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Tish Jones was a part of this show, but we had to cut our whole section. <laughs> that Tish. All right, that's cool. I got it. It's all good. Hip hop can be clean. They sell edited versions. Now what if you having girl problems? I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problems, but a chick ain't one. That's hoes. Now what I am, whatever you say I am. If I wasn't, then why would I say I am? That's Slim Shady. And now what we are not the same. I am a Mar. Now what Mar? Now what Martian? That's Weezy F, baby. If you ain't gonna die for doing the right thing. What you gonna die for? My grandfather asked me that question. Check it. I knew this brother who claimed he wasn't scared of nothing, dude. Packed him a little bit of something, dude would bust if he went from calm to crunk too fast. He wore an S across his chest like Superman, but I called him kryptonite, his own worst enemy when days didn't end at night, cause he had to sleep light with the burner and the knife and fear of his life every time the wooden floor didn't creep right and peep, right? He said it was all for his slice of the American pie. Got mad when I sat him down, looked him in the eye, and said, bruh, how bad do you want to die? He said, yeah, well, if you having girl problems, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problems, but a chick ain't one. Uh, I'm like, bruh, how bad do you want to die? He said, forget you, Tish, man. I live this ish. I had to earn my silver spoon and dish, so why wouldn't I be ready to die for that? Yeah, what 99 problems, but a chick ain't one. Why wouldn't I be ready to die for that? I'm like, bruh, why you stacking your figures? It's somebody watching your every move, waiting to come and get you. And this ain't our destiny. He said, this is the best for me. I said, you can do better, G. He said, man, whatever be, this world ain't letting me. So as scared as I am to die, I pledge my allegiance to these streets. It's death already just being me. Plus, I need this money, queen. I got a slang to feed my seed. I wasn't 99 problems, but a chick ain't one. I got a slang to feed my seed. So I'm like, bruh, 
Let me see if I hear you for the five stacks in your pocket. If my missile is big as a rocket, we're at your dome. Would you really be ready to go home alone? Would you really be ready to live by the streets and die by the chrome, brother? Become an unknown, brother, and lose the opportunity to watch your seeds grow? Bruh, how bad? Mm. He looks back at me and he's like, you know what, Tish? I sort of kind of remember when you used to act like that. In fact, I'm kind of bugging on how you figure you could even form your lips to ask me that question. How bad do I want to die for him? How bad did you? And I'm like, yeah. I sort of kind of remember being a cat that walked the path to the gangster beat limping. I delize in criminology, thug life, and pimping it. Just in case my terminology is too ebonic for your addiction, minister, society, boys in the hood is my fact, no fiction. I'm versatile with positions of short stops, been no stop short of a butt whip and wait, listen. I've been in situations asking, will I live or will I die? Thanking God for all the angels that fly by my side. I've lost, I've cried, had friends that died My best friend used to be a 4-5 Hit stains, took rise My belt grand theft auto My belt just short of attempted manslaughter Stomach empty I be hungry and pains daughter I'm like, should I go on? He's like, I think that you ought I'm like, I did the one parent household And received my father on the other end of the telephone Saying that he had no daughter Stuff starter, I was Question, do you answer? Yes, I stay buzzed Medicating emotions and I ain't ready to touch Hence why I wear gloves No evidence, cuz I would never sell my story You couldn't pay me enough Too many projects, stories, fights Run down apartment buildings, project tenements, and broken hallways and elevators that won't take you to the level that I'm on. I'm beyond speaking on bullshit. I was 99 problems, but a chick came once. So I'm like, yeah, I sort of kind of remember when I used to act like that. In fact, that's how I figured I could form my lips to ask you that question, bro. So how bad do you? He uh, he goes and he stands behind the record, the records again, right? And he's like, you know, Tish, the answer has always been in the music. Listen, he said, uh, oh, what if you having girl problems, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problems, but a chick ain't one. Oh, what a chick ain't one. Oh, what a chick ain't one. Because I am whatever they say I am. If I wasn't, then why would they say I am? In the papers, the news, every day I am. Oh, what a Martian. I look. He looks. And he's like, I don't think you're listening to me, man. If you want to know how bad I want to die, why I do what I do. Listen to the music. He said, oh, what if you having girl problems? I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problems. I want 99 problems, but a chick ain't one. Because I am whatever they say I am. If I wasn't, then why would they say I am? In the papers, the news, radio, TVs, magazines, convenience stores. When I walk down the street, people clutch their purse, turn up their nose. Because to them, I am a Martian. I think that's becoming one of my favorite pieces. Um, only because I do a lot of hip hop education, man, and people always have some funny style to say about hip hop out here. And uh, I really do think that if you listen to hip hop music, like on some hip hop pedagogy, how can you educate through hip hop? There's a, there's a lot of really rich material. Anyway, so the last piece that I'm gonna um, perform, um, let me find it. I had it, I don't know where it went. It's called, uh, it's called You Have to Tell Your Mother That a She Is Your Lover for the Freedom That You Seek. In the center of my most sacred text, her spirit becomes erect. Our leaves have changed. Permanence found in seasonal mood swings now stick to the cold of us like frozen rain, and she thinks you'll be happier next fall. There is no wrong, I write. We have made nouns of verbs and lost our will to be. Tonight we test power, two electricians who have refused to fuse, but there's too much light to closet this love, or call it a was on a whim of winds and others once. No once will trump and ever tethered together by the tale of time as fallacy and malice breeding tragedy. In your silence, you still ask for me. You haven't left. You simply stepped into the crevice of my eyes to find residence in my dreams where your spirit sings a scream. Tell your mother I gave you an offering of queen. Queen. Wandering through you for years without fear of being lost, it cost me nothing if we part. Our meeting means meaning. Make sense? Still. 
Tell her how you've missed me since, and still there's something to be said of our passing in silence. It could be death, only I don't know that I believe in dying. There's no power in that, so tell her that we live, and there are no holes to be filled between us. We are whole planets engulfing one another in the shadow of the sky, right beside the moon, tongues guided by the sun. We speak one when undone together. Don't let her call this energy accustomed. We have made no customs, only come froms of circumferences. Tell her, you have been here. You have bore body, beautiful and bare, and I have bore witness to you becoming, seeing you brave and unbound by the crossfire of crosses and familial crucifixes, now fixated on being dated by the way happy belated, another pressure just restated, you want children, let's create them, life is not the mark of Satan, and if she asks you why, recite our life, tell her that in a moment ripe with fear, I once removed my shoes, bearing my soul, the bravest thing any soul could ever do, tell her that you always see me seeing you when we see one another, tell her it is a practice to approach you with passion, and that I don't keep your secrets, we we share them, we share them, have me. Have me as a doing, nothing to be kept but to be with in company. Companionship, relationships that never dock are destined for adventure. If I am your mate and you are mine, let seeing be the captain. <clears throat> Nary a mother ship where you are torn and split like some sort of contortionist. Tell her, tell her I love you like I tell it to you, full bodied and fearless, or leave me to love you in passing. Thank you. So before I step down, I'm actually going to say that um, this new thing that's not really new is happening. So um, annually, Minnesota does a quest. We have a quest. We do a series of slams to find six young people in between the ages of 13 to 19 to represent our state in the International Brave New Voices Youth Poetry Slam Festival. And the Minnesota Spoken Word Association has passed the torch to me in terms of um, facilitating that process, right? Yeah, give it up for that. They've held it down for some years, for real. So from January 2013 to March 2013, we are holding a series of slams in the Twin Cities to identify those six young people. If you are one of them or you know young people that do spoken word poetry, please tell them to go to facebook.com backslash MN Youth Slam. Word, thank you for your time. That music in the background. There's a group called The Leaders. The title of the song is Donkey Dust. Just wanted you to hear a little bit of that before we went forward. And I'm gonna walk very slowly back to Fade It. If you want to hear more hip music like that, listen to Mostly Jazz on Saturday mornings on KFAI 90.3 FM in Minneapolis and 106.7 FM in St. Paul. And on the World Wide Web at KFAI.org, 9 a.m. Saturday mornings. He plays music like that from cats like that on that show. Woo, Tish. That was hip hop ish and bebop ish. I had to slow down in order to catch up with myself. I feel so good about the energy in this room because there are so many loving people in the room. I mean, people that I love and people that love me and people who are in my poems and people who inspire me. And I just, um, it's, it's great to be in a community, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, just to see faces and feel spirits of people who like embrace you just by being in the room with you, you know? That's, that's very, um, that's a very fortunate situation to be in. And uh, I, just, um, I just look out and see so much love. Thank you so much for all the love in the room.
There's a very good friend of mine who uh, made an exit recently. Her name was, her name is Janice Lee Porter. Some of you may know her. She is uh, a painter. And uh, she and I, along with Anthony Peyton Porter, uh, collaborated on a book together. And Janice did the illustrations, I wrote the poems, and Anthony was the editor. And after we worked on the project together, the painting that became the cover of the book she gave to me as a gift, and she hadn't titled the painting yet. And so I, um, I said, well, I'll give it a title. And she said, yeah, OK. So she gave me the opportunity to title her painting. And uh, you can go to Facebook uh, on the Homewood Studios page and find a photograph of the painting if you want to see it later. I made a donation of the painting to Homewood Studios, so you can actually go to Homewood Studios and see the painting. It was just at my house, and nobody comes through there. So I wanted it to be so community would have access to it. And I decided to write a poem about the title and about the painting. And I'm going to share that before I introduce Shay Cage to you. See, I'm trying to hold myself back, because mm -hmm. I'm just used to being extravagant. With yourself, ain't that? <laughs> <laughs> hey, no. Smart Alec. The title of the poem is, He Likes His Point of View. Here's your answer. Adamus is known to be oppositional and argumentative. Agreeing with other points of view seem bland when there is no definitive position and perspectives shift like tsunami sands. A stigmatized vision rules this world and mark every time and tale of triumph with disgrace and infamy. Some inherit only wind with its questions about ocean depth and soul width, the length and breadth of life's unending renewal of confusion and chaos. When blown children of dandelions are uprooted by breezes in humid air pockets dispersed indiscriminately among grasses and flowers blown into manicured lawns that reek of herbicides. He is a son of a dandelion daddy who only dropped his seed. Asynphalic stems of dandelions, father of future, while rooted in stigmata of past absurdity. Gale forces govern spirits without solid footing and demand answers to questions God's venture about the sway of strong wills, the temperature of heat indexes, and side effects of insecticide on genetic structures. Adamus has grown hard and jaded despite attempts to weed him out. Without synthetic fertilizer, he returns each spring to litter air and lawns, for he has purpose beyond appreciation, beyond illusions of perfection. Bastard plants won't be cultivated, protected, or arranged into bouquets. They are worthless. They are priceless. They, like him, project radical perspectives, change worlds in undesirable and troublesome ways. He that grows 
profusely where he is not wanted. An ungainly man, valueless and cultivated on ground that nobody wants him on is the X factor. His neck stretches and contorts until his point of view is upside down, inside out, until he sees the other side of every opinion. He is only superfluous to those who hold truth as privilege, those invested in the way things are. He's among the chronically unemployed, the ironically unemployable, because he resists history with impunity. He won't celebrate Columbus Day or Juneteenth. They are mendacious conundrums, fulgurant strobes of bad records, of people denied liberty and justice. He is in the 47%. He is Adamus, Thursday's child, with so far to go, born on Thanksgiving into American apartheid in a world with no use for him. He is screaming saxophones in orchestra hall, loud conversations in the public library. Adamus is Duende in fluorescent rooms, calling for the madness needed to invent a future, to rewrite stories from dandelion views. <laughs> recently, well, it wasn't too recently. The weather was warm. <laughs> I remember that. At the Playwright Center, I went to see um, an incarnation of a work in progress uh, called N period, I period, G period, G period, E period, R period. And it was amazing. Shea Cage is a current McKnight Playwright Fellow. Let's give her a yeah. Big ups for that. She's an arts educator, an arts administrator. She's a thespian that has um, graced most of the theatrical stages around town, but a lot of people are not aware of her writing prowess. I mentioned uh, the Gibbons Writers Retreat earlier, and uh, Shea Cage was in the first group at the writer's retreat with uh, the mentors, uh, Amiri Baraka and myself. And uh, she claims that she started writing this piece while she was at that retreat. And I say, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of remember that, actually. But it has grown in leaps and bounds from the draft I saw uh, when she was there. But um, I, I don't know what parts of it she's gonna bring this evening, but I know if she brings it, it's gonna be bad. So bring it. and say race is a figment of our imagination. Race is a figment of our imagination. I turn to your other neighbor and say, culture ain't. Culture ain't. Because there's a difference, right? Right? Elder Mahmoud El Qadi helped me to understand that when I was at McAllister College. Mentors like Jay Otis and Janice and Carolyn and Beverly and Bill and Takumba and the list goes on have helped me come closer to understanding it as I've grown into a woman. Huh. When you're on a main stage theater, you're really far from the people. <laughs> so eh, it's been a long time since I've been this close. 
you can you, you, there's no wig, you know. It's like the wizard has sort of taken off the. How y'all doing? Good. Yeah. Good. There's a lot of really good energy in the room, and I'm I'm gonna use it to figure out which pieces I'll share, and then I want to make time. When it's time for me to get off, say get off. N I G G E R. Okay, class. As you know, we've, we'll be heading to the United States next month on our Cultural Connections Project. I have been given this book of terms to help us understand the cultural histories we will be dealing with. Parker, are you listening? Parker, are you listening? You can think you're cute with those baggy pants and that New York cap you're wearing, but I don't want you to go over there to the United States and use some of these terms incorrectly. Do you understand? Okay. Aunt Jemima, also referenced as Aunt Jane, Aunt Mary, Aunt Sally, Aunt Thomasina, a black woman who kisses up to whites, a sellout, female counterpart of Uncle Tom, taken from the popular syrup of the same name where Aunt Jemima is represented as a black woman. Blue gum, an offensive slur used by some US white southerners for African Americans perceived as being lazy and who refuse to work. Boogie, a black person in film noir, example given, the boogies lowered the boom on Beaver Canal. Buck, a black person also used to describe Native Americans. Buffy, a black person. Burhead, a black person. Colored, a black person. Once generally accepted as inoffensive, this word is now considered disrespectful by some. The NAACP continues to use its full name unapologetically. Some black Americans have reclaimed this word and softened it in the expression, a person of color. Coon, used in the US and UK, a black person, possibly from Portuguese or Baracus, or a building constructed to hold slaves for sale. Crow, a black person, specifically a black woman. Eggplant, a black person. In the 1979 classic film, The Jerk, the leading character played by Steve Martin is advised by his associates to keep the eggplants out of his planned housing development. Eggplants, Steve asks. Yeah, the eggplants. The jungle bunnies, says the other guy. Of course, bunnies will eat the eggplants, says Steve. No, I mean the niggas says the other guy, what, says Steve Martin, I am a nigger. Fuzzies, a black person. In the 1964 film classic Zulu, the British officer played by Michael Caine refers to the Zulus as fuzzies. Gable, a black person. Gollywog, a dark-skinned black person. After Florence Kate Upton's children's book character, a jigaboo, jigaboo, g-e-gigaboo, zigaboo, jig, jig, jiggy, jiga. US and UK, this term is used, a black person with stereotypical black features, dark skin, wide nose, etc. The term jig was often used by Richard Nixon when speaking in private, used to refer to mannerisms that resemble dancing. Jim Crow, US, a black person. Also the name for segregation, laws prevalent in much of the United States until the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. Kaffir, Kaffir. Kafir, Kafir, Kafir. South African, a black person considered very offensive. Makaka, epithet used to describe a Negro originally or a person of North African origin more recently, came to public attention in 2006 when the US Senator George Allen infamously used it to refer to one of Jim Webb's volunteers, S.R. Siddharth, when he said, this fellow here, over here, with the yellow shirt, Makaka, or whatever his name is. Mammy, domestic servant of African descent, generally good-natured, often overweight and loud. Moosehead, a black person. Munt, among whites in South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Zambia, a black person from Muntu, 
the singular of Bantu, Nignog, used in UK, UK and US, a black person, Picaninny, a term generally considered derogatory, that in English used to refer to black children or caricatures of them, which is widely considered racist. Porch monkey, powder burn, a black person, Sambo, a derogatory term used for African Americans, black or sometimes South Asian people. Shiboom, a black person, combination of she and baboon. Smoked Irish or smoked Irish man, 19th century term for blacks, intended to insult both blacks and Irish. Sooty, a black person, originated in the US in the 50s. Spade, a black person, recorded since 1928 from the playing card suit. Spook, a black person, spook, a black person, and finally, N-I-G-G-E-R, pronounced nigger, but also known as nigra, nigga, 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 an offensive term for black person, from the word negro, which means the color black in numerous languages, diminutive appellations include nig, nigs, with a z, over time, the term nigga and niggas, plural, have come to be frequently used between some African Americans without the negative association of nigger. Neglect is known as a black child. Negra, 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 negro. Offensive terms for black persons, first used in the early 1900s. Next week, we will cover Italians and Jews. Are you listening? Are you? Are you? Turn to your neighbor and say, race is a figment of our imagination. And to your other neighbor, culture ain't. Two. that stares her still each morning begging for a nod, a wink, a simple, I see you, black girl. Look at her, look at her. I see you, black girl. You see, she is a history made up. She wears rude red lipstick on most days, thick and sticky like plantation whips, dripping dried histories of people who found themselves on foreign soil, transported across ocean morgues away from home. Look at her, look at her. She is a history made up, away from home, from native land. Liquid gardens planted with broken bones of people whose oom boom ba boom was banned years before any body of their mother's generation could hardly remember. Look at her. Hers is a history made up. No more auction block for me. Hers is a history made up. Her life is music. Her life is blues resting over her left eye. Her life is jazz. Her life is hip hop scratched across her body and permanent scars that she's come to admire. <coughs> Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt her. 
list goes on. Hers is a history made up. But the gospel in her life doesn't leave space for understanding the relationship between poverty and violence against women, between illiteracy and the choices they are left with. Her life is full of too much funk to make the mental connection, so the cycle continues, continues, continues. Her life is jazz, improvising its way into her life, trick after trick. Her life is music, no more action black for me. Southerner, affluent. I remember the first time we met, down to the moment, yes I do. I, I'll never forget it because it was the first time I had ever felt like that before. I'd been told what love was and what it felt like and that sometimes you could really see someone for the first time without ever knowing them before and, and, and fall head over heels in love. Uh, love at first sight, that's what they call it. Well, I am a living and breathing example of, of that reality. From the moment we were introduced on that dance floor at the Thompson's Gala, he, he was my world. Thaddeus Lamar Wright. You see, I, I live a pretty, sheltered life. I guess you could say that. My parents were both lawyers and lo and behold we were part of the league of blacks that had newly come into their freedom, tradesmen. So we came from an entrepreneurial ancestry and not necessarily one so embedded in slavery. I remember once my sister was pushed down into the mud and she was called a nigger. And I will never forget my father yelling at those bullies. She is worth more money than any of you all put together. I told her, the next time somebody calls you a name, you tell them to come see me. You see, we were taught that we were different from others, not, not only the whites, but the blacks too. I always wanted to say, but, but daddy, we look just like the other blacks. I guess I quickly learned that looks can be deceiving which is why our type of people form societies like the Black Masons and debutantes, Elks, Blue Bloods, that's what we were called. So that we would know which type of person our suitor was and, and not be misguided into falling for the wrong type of person. It was quite complicated in those times. I do remember that. <laughs> but after a while, it became natural. As, a young, as young children, we loved the parties. After a while, it became natural. As young children, we loved the parties, the socials, the balls, with beautiful gowns, and oh, incredibly gorgeous people. Blue bloods. <laughs> we thought we were unbreakable. Boarding school was the only thing my sister and I hated. But mother and father traveled a great deal, just like my husband Thaddeus. So this was something I came to understand quite well and eventually accept. You see, when a young woman is introduced to a young man in society, nine times out of 10, that would be the man she would marry. Our kind of people went to great lengths to keep the money and the blood in our world. Our kind of people went to great lengths to keep the money and the family. There was great detail in assuring our suitor would be the right kind. It wasn't completely like an arranged marriage because two people had to like each other, usually. But a great deal of conversation between the two families had preceded that introduction at the Thompsons. Every girl just hoped to God he didn't have a dog face. And second, that he'd simply be kind, both of which my Thaddeus were in the beginning. It was so blissful at first. He treated me like a princess, like I was the only one on the planet. That was before the company merger. Then they started demanding so much more out of him. It was stressful. So instead, he, instead of turning to me, he chose the bottle, 
than other women, usually white, the kind that didn't ask questions or talk back, as he put it. Niggas can be so much work, he liked to joke around the house. But I tell people that love comes in many colors. <laughs> it's not always green, and sometimes can damn well turn blood red. But you see, marriage is, it, it's about commitment through thick and thin. It, it's, it's just that clear cut through lies and hatred, strong enough to kill through accidental slips of his fists across your cheek followed by tears that beg for forgiveness through strange female voices on the other end of the receiver and late night meetings that couldn't possibly be at the office. And also through birthdays that make you smile and childbirths and God knows soft caresses you wouldn't trade in for anything. Love is not always happy. Anybody that thinks it is is purely deluded. And that's why I stood by him, because deep down, underneath it all, he was a good man, despite what everyone in this town says he was. And he was a decent, loving father. I'm sorry I get so emotional when I talk about Thaddeus. It's just since his passing, <clears throat> I try only to remember the good things. Yes, because that's what a good wife is supposed to do. That's what they teach us. And that's what they taught us in the links. And that's what I teach my children. No. It wasn't the best relationship, it wasn't. But we stuck together and we loved each other through thick and thin. Yes, through thick and thin. Somebody's auntie, borderline crazy. Is the camera on? What, what I'm just asking, is the camera on? Because the last time you, you, you came down here and you said some stuff about the footage not being good, and this time I just want to make sure that I'm going to make the cut. Don't look all cross with me. You came down here a couple years ago interviewing people about being black. You think I forgot? No, I ain't forget nothing. The problem with people like you is that you just got time for this kind of stuff. I can't believe they give you money to do this? A grant? I, you can't, I can think of the things that I can do with a grant. Yes, the word is bad. Nigga, nigga. It's a bad word. We all know it is, but we use it. Sometimes without even thinking. We don't have time to be figuring out when and how we use it like you do. We're busy figuring out how to just live life day to day. Last time they gave you some kind of grant to come down here, them people gave you, you know what? I'll be damn, I don't see that red light. This camera ain't even up. You know what? I'm done with this. <laughs> Elder. I remember when I came to this country from Liberia, my whole family was so happy for me. They said, oh, you're going to be so happy in America. Oh, yeah, there's going to be money falling from the trees. The people are going to love you. You know, I was first generation. Yeah, I can still remember my first day at school. My mama, she dressed me up so pretty. I had the barrettes in my hair. I had bracelets. Oh, I was so beautiful. And these cute white socks up to my knee. And the bus, it picked me up right in front of my house. It was the happiest day of my life. I was in America. It was like I was a chosen one. Then I went to the school. And I remember that class. Yeah, I will never, ever forget that class. I walked in, and that little boy, he just, he just looked at my face. He looked at my face, and he started to laugh. It was the meanest laugh anybody had ever given me, even through all the war time back home. It made me feel like I was different. He didn't even have to use no words. I knew what he was thinking. He was saying, you think you look good, you black person. Go back home. 
Hey, the way it made my heart feel. But I didn't care, because I knew I looked good. And deep down, my heart was crying. I went back home, they said, how was it? I said, it was good. It was just like you said. It was so nice. Educated sister. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I am not going to lie. I use the word liberally. I have two masters and I'm working on my PhD. And it's not about being undereducated. I know who I am and I love myself and my people. I'm a teacher for God's sake. I know the history and I can honestly say that we, the younger generation, have reinvented the term. It's not just the same, it's not just the same word it was years ago. It's about kindred, about brotherhood and connection, a shared language and code. I use the term in love. And yes, I will say that I know to some degree I'm being hypocritical, but it's a term for us to use in communication with other black people. And it's not for others outside our community to use it. That's just how I feel. I think I have one more. I have one more to share with you. Bar scene. <clears throat> The year 1989, setting juke joint, you know, that corner bar in somebody's, everybody's neighborhood. Neon sign that you can't quite make out, just hanging from the string. Best drinks on this side of the Mississippi. The bartender, Miss Rosie, they call her. Looks like life ain't been too kind to her. But a smile sexy enough to fry pork chops on. Pours her drink strong and tall. Can he come with you, Tish? Okay. Tish, Tish is showing. Can you put Angry Birds on there for him? Okay. So you wanna put Angry Birds? I'm gonna do one more. You're doing really good, Jordan. You're doing good. Should we put it on there? Yes. Go get a cookie, Jordan. Brother walks in, tall, dark-skinned brother, sees a pretty brown sister at the bar, does a double take, puts on his best pimp walk, sexy, smooth, one leg leading, one leg dragging, Mac Daddy stroll. Hey, baby, how's it going, he asks. How you think it's going, Black? Some nerve you got. Whoa, let's start this train over. Seems we must have got off on the wrong track. You can't get off of something you ain't never got on. The name's chocolate, double dip, dog chocolate, Charlie, they call me. You must be silly wearing a name like that, chocolate Charlie. Who you kidding? More like midnight sky, blue black, and that's on a good day. Ooh, you's one of them feisty sisters. I like a woman with spice. Look, I ain't never like nothing dark and nothing. You, I ain't never like nothing dark about nothing. You wasting your time, brother. Sugar, you ain't never tasted sugar this rich. One bite and you're hooked. Black, you better watch where you walking. This ain't no crystal stair. Baby, I done been to hell and back and the devil ain't got me yet. And I done told you once, gonna tell you again, the name's Chocolate. Look, we ain't in no Baskin Robin. When I look at your black butt, that's what I see. So that's what you're gonna be, a black brother on this black street and this rundown black neighborhood on this corner street black bar living this black reality. Ooh, somebody done stole your pretty brown thunder, honey, but don't you fear, for the first time in your life, you met a brother who's real. I'm gonna chase him down and steal it back and deliver it to you with roses, pearls, and a box of dark chocolate on your doorstep. 
What you say your name is? Thank you. I'll be, um, I want to just continue to acknowledge the people that helped me. So it's a full length piece and I'll be uh, premiering it in the UK and New York at the end of next year. Um, but I will be showing four nights of the developed work on stage at Intermedia Arts in March of next year. So I invite you to come. I want to thank the Givens Foundation for helping me develop the work, the Jerome Foundation, the Playwright Center, and the McKnight Foundation as well. I want to announce a very special evening before the end of the year. Jay Otis Powell, one of my mentors, is releasing a CD, his second CD, called Balm, and it's amazing. It will be at the Loft Literary Center, and that will be on December 21st. Please come out, y'all. It will be a really incredible evening of family and good music and art. Ashe. I told you. Our time is up, so we're going to have to go. But um, in anticipation of what Shay was going to do, I watched again um, for the umpteenth time, 51st Dream State by um, Seiko Sundiata. And um, while Shea was up here reading, I decided to leave you with these lines that are kind of pieces from different places. The first one to be the last one to know, my nigga, yo nigga, that nigga, that nigga who won't stay in the car when you tell him to stay in the car. The first one to be the last one to know. Nigga, please. One more thing, we've got the Kumbas art that he's been drawing through the night. Love. <laughs> 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 My family. 